We're growing spinach, we're growing kale, we're growing Swiss chard, we're growing up to 30 different greens that are frost resistant and frost hardy. We have a greenhouse and then we're having mini tunnels inside the greenhouse. We're able to grow these fresh greens from November to April. You're listening to the Food Garden Life Show, the show that helps you grow food, whether it's on a balcony, in a backyard, or bigger. I'm your host, Stephen Biggs. And I'm your host, Donna Balzer. Together we talk with gardening experts, and we talk about what we've done in our years in the horticultural trade, helping you bend the rules and grow food in a way that suits you and your growing zone. Welcome to Season 7, Episode 5, and we do not have to shut down our gardens for the winter. We can garden through the winter, even in northern climates. Today, we head to Quebec to chat with J.M. Forche, who is a market gardener and an educator. For longtime listeners, you might remember that J.M. joined us Season 3, Episode 69, talking about profitable small-scale farming. And that was after his book, The Market Gardener, came out, and in that book, he talks about the big potential of small-scale farms. Well, he has a new book out that he's co-authored with Catherine Sylvester, and it's called The Winter Market Gardener, a successful grower's handbook for year-round harvests. JM's a busy guy. He talks in the interview about FQT Farm, where they've done a lot of the research for this book. He's also the founder of Growers & Co., which supplies equipment, and clothing for farmers. And he's the co-founder of the Market Gardener Institute, which trains farmers. So Donna, last night for supper, I served squash that I grew. We had some beets that I grew, and I think we threw in some microgreens that I was growing under lights here. But I did not have any leafy greens from my garden because I'm just not set up to do that. So in listening to today's interview, I think what I'd really like to cherry pick for myself is tips on how I can set things up here fairly simply to grow through the winter. And, and longtime listeners know that my daughter Emma has been hectoring me forever to get a greenhouse. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm hoping to get some pointers for that. How about you? What do you think you'll get out of this? Right. I actually am looking forward to hearing about how he does the winter greens. I know in the book, he talks about double layering. So I am lucky enough to have a greenhouse and adding that extra layer inside the greenhouse sounds like that's all you need to do because some things like spinach, according to the book, can get down to minus 23. So I'm very excited about that. And I am sorry I missed the actual interview with you, but I'm keen to listen in and see what JM has to say. Good. Well, we will debrief after the interview. Jean-Martin, to begin with, tell us about Femme des Quatre Temps. Well, Femme des Quatre Temps, we call it FQT Farm. It was a project that I started in 2015. To sum it up, and I'll tell you a bit more about how it started, but to sum it up, it's a 150-acre farm. It has, it has a commercial kitchen, really nice program there. It has uh, 70 cow calves. 500 chickens that are in egg mobiles, and it has 400 hogs that are in the forest in the summer and partially inside in the winter. And there's a big market garden in the middle of all of this. This is where I train young market gardeners to be really be as successful as they can be or really well trained. And so it's a holistic farm and it was started it's it's funded and financed by a very wealthy businessman here in uh, Montreal, in Quebec. And it was started on the premise that we wanted to create what the farm of the future would look like. And that farm would be holistic. It would have, you know, all the, the animals working in synergy with the gardens. And then all, you know, the manure would serve you know, for growing the veggies and all the leftovers from the veggies would be, you know, transformed in the culinary program. 
And so that was the original idea. And I was approached to, to do that farm. It, was, it didn't exist before. It was actually Elliot Coleman that, that introduced me to uh, the owner of the farm. And, uh, you know, I, funny story is that it took uh, three meetings for me to kind of get down with the program because Elliot was like, you need to meet that person. He's very interested in collaborating and he wants to, you know, talk about the revolution and then just like showcase what's possible. And I, at that time, I was really wasn't interested in working with, with a billionaire. It just didn't make any sense in my mind. And eventually he kind of, Elliot kind of forced the handle and I met the owner and we hit it off right, right from the get-go. I was super stimulated, highly interested. And I was also excited about having a, a school where I could teach all the, the market gardening tips and tricks that I had been developing over the years. And so that's, that's how it started. Okay. Well, so we'll fast forward to today. And now you have this holistic farm of the future. And one of the things that you're doing there is winter growing. And I think mm -hmm. maybe for our listeners, we should distinguish between winter growing and greenhouse growing in the winter. Can you explain, yeah. that? unpack that? Yeah. Well, you know, what we do is that we're minimally heating or not heating at all our cold houses or smaller greenhouses. And we're growing greens in them. We're growing spinach. We're growing kale. We're growing Swiss chard. We're, we're growing, you know, up to 30 different greens that are frost resistant and frost hardy. And just by having an extra shelter and another one, because we have like a greenhouse and then we're having mini tunnels inside the greenhouse, we're able to grow these fresh greens from, you know, November to April, harvest them from November to April. and that's very different from greenhouse systems, especially in the winter where you would have, let's say, a big greenhouse with, you know, lots uh, of square footage, even acreage under a, a greenhouse with, you know, high tech systems. Uh, we're, we're adding some heat, uh, some light, you know, we're kind of trying to mimic uh, summer conditions in the winter. And so we're, it's very input intensive, these greenhouses, and that's really not what we're doing. We're going low tech. We are working with the biology of plants. We're adapting the plants with different strategies that we implement. We're, we're adapting them to the cold. So they become more and more frost hardy. We're working with cultivars that have been select, selected for their cold hardiness. And we're really growing a product like these vegetables that are very different than in terms of taste, in terms of texture than that of, of the summer months. And so we're, we're working with the Northern climate to grow a, a product, to grow greens that are, you know, world-class, epic, amazing. Mm. And so it's, it's very different. Okay. High tech versus low tech. And yet uh, yeah, we're getting this epic result. Yeah, we're getting better results because, you know, I don't know if your listeners are aware of this, but when COVID hit, you know, we we realized that you know it doesn't take long for our supermarkets to fall short and not have, you know, what they need if the borders are closed. Let's say, and you know, we know that in Quebec, I'm not sure in Canada. It's probably the same. About 70% of all the vegetables that we eat in the winter come from California and for abroad. So we're very dependent on, on vegetables grown outside the province, outside the country. And so, you know, when COVID hit, the government decided that they wanted it to be more self-sufficient. We started to talk about food sovereignty. And their response to that was to just invest a lot of money to double the number of greenhouses here in Quebec. But unfortunately, these greenhouses were high tech and, you know, they're growing strawberries in the winter, you know, for example. Right. And uh, right. Catherine and I at that time, we just felt this is not, this is not where this should be going. 
And that's, that's why we wrote our book in the first place. We have a lot of home gardeners tuning into the show and, and I suspect they might be asking the question, well, can home gardeners take some of these things that you're doing and use them in a home garden setting? Yeah, well, what, what we do here in our greenhouse is not complicated. It's, it's just about knowing firstly that it's possible, having some equipment, but not that much. But it's mostly following a planting schedule and, and guides and knowing which cultivars to, you know, everybody knows kale, but which kale there's, you know, there's a lot of different cultivars out there. So what we do here on a bigger scale could be done in a home garden. You know, I've just opened the restaurant near my home farm and, you know, we have a winter greenhouse that's providing veggies for the restaurant and for the winter. It's, it's just about having a shelter and it could be a carport, something like that, that you have in your garden. And then you, you know, you cover it with a, with a plastic film, but then inside you also put another little tunnel or you, you use these woven fabric that are kind of insulating blankets. So you open them in the day, you close them during the night or you leave them on and you just add a little bit of supplementary heat. Like, let's say, wire for gutters, you know, to defrost the gutters Yeah, that you plug into you, you know, 110 AC. You can use that, lay that on your beds. And, you know, as long as you have like kind of two covers and you plant at the right dates and the right cultivars and with the right spacing, you're good to go. And then, you know, imagine that when you're having your friends at home for a meal and, you know, you're... Stepping out of the kitchen, going outside, picking your salads from the greenhouse and then coming back. It's a great way to impress people. Sure is. So, okay, people will, at home, they'll be thinking about having two covers over a crop. And yep. in, in the book, in, in the Winter Market Gardener, four covers, you're talking about row covers and caterpillar, caterpillar tunnels, low tunnels and high tunnels. And I wonder if you can just briefly Explain what each of those is. Yeah. So row cover is like this woven fabric. Look, feel it's like a blanket, very light, and it lets light through about 80%, but it retains the heat. So it has a thermal capacity. So the heat radiating from the ground kind of comes out and then the blanket kind of keeps it inside the tunnel because we're creating, we're we're putting these blankets on hoops, wire hoops. So these are like mini tunnels. They're about two feet high and they're, you know, 30 inch wide, the size of our beds. And then we have these blankets over them. Now that's inside, you know, a, a greenhouse and the greenhouse, you know, cold tunnel, greenhouse, it's all the same word to say that, you know, it's a, so these are, you know, metal arches that are covered by translucent film, greenhouse film. And so that's, these are the two concepts that we're working with. Okay. So those, the, the greenhouses or the, the tunnels, we're talking about something permanent, whereas with the row cover, we're putting inside the greenhouse something that's not permanent, that's easily movable. Exactly. Mm. Coming up, JM will talk about crops for winter growing. That's coming up in just a moment. A shout out today to those of you tuning in on YouTube. This season is the first season we've really put any thought into YouTube. It was just an afterthought before. So, hey, thanks for hanging out with us on YouTube. And for those of you who want to check us out on YouTube, our handle is at Food Garden Life. Drop by to see what we're up to at foodgardenlife.com. We have some new source lists. If you're looking for nut trees, fruit trees, veggie seeds, figs, we have source guides on those. And we've also refreshed our two free ebooks 20 Small Space Food Garden Hacks 
and grow figs in cold climates. You're listening to the Food Garden Life Show. The show that helps you grow food, whether it's on a balcony, in a backyard, or bigger. Now, back to our chat with J.M. Forche, co-author of The Winter Market Gardener. With crops, you distinguish between very cold hardy, cold hardy, and semi-hardy. Let's unpack yes. that. <laughs> Yeah, well, it's, 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 again, we're referring to the biology. So we're using the biology. Instead of recreating summer conditions in the winter, we're adapting to low light. We're adapting to cold temperatures. And we're using plants that are resistant, that can tolerate low light conditions, grow in their, under low light conditions. I don't know if your listeners know this, but uh, where we are on our parallel, you know, as of the mid November, uh, there's under 10 hours of daylight per day. So even if you're heating at, you know, 35 degrees Celsius, the greenhouse, there's no growth because there's not enough light for the plants to really grow. And so from you know, mid November all the way to February, that's pretty much what's going on. So we need to work with plants that can tolerate some cold, but then can also grow under, you know, lower, lower light conditions. And so we've categorized them in three. And, you know, I, what we can say is like the most frost hardy is definitely spinach. And spinach grows really well under low light condition. Kale is another workhorse. It's just amazing. Kale is really beautiful in that way. But there's others that people don't know as much. Mosh, for your listeners that have perhaps been in Europe, mosh in France is a very popular salad. Uh, it really grows well in the winter. But, you know, there's all these Asian greens that people perhaps know about. Tatsoi, pak choy, tuna, all these mustards. They're, they also grow really well uh, in the winter. And then there's the salads, you know, salad heads, but these are not as frost hardy. They're kind of, they can take a light frost, but if it's minus five for a few days, you know, they'll die. If it's, if it's mi minus one, minus two for a night, and then it comes back, they're okay. So we've categorized all these different crops and there's 30 of them that we grow according to how tolerant they are to the frost. And, and I should say for listeners too, you have lots of detail on those crops within the book too. So it's an excellent guide. Yeah, well, it's, uh, well, thank you. It's, it's seven years of R and D at FQT farm where, you know, we're growing commercially. Our goal is to, we work with 25 different chefs here in Montreal. We're supplying them year round with these, with these greens. So it, is, it was a lot of trial and error, right dates, right cultivar, right spacing, because the spacing, let's say we're planting kale in our beds, it won't be the same spacing that we put in the summer because we want to have more light penetrating the soil. Mm. So we, we, we need to give a bit, a bit more room for certain plant. So finding all these things, you know, took us a few years. And with the book, our goal is to share that so that people can be, you know, following the right procedures, starting off with a game plan that already is guaranteed to work. But it's also about just planting the seed in people's mind, gardener's mind that, you know, at the end of the summer, just keep planting. It's totally possible. Okay. And... and I think, too, for people to think about this idea of not eating as you might eat if you go to the supermarket and expecting romaine lettuce 12 months a year. Is that right? Yeah, and that, that's, that's clearly a big part of, of my message. We live in a northern country, and we should, we should eat what's in season. And there's so many root vegetables. So what we do is we, you know, we grow greens in the winter, but we supplement the diet. 
with those greens of other vegetables that are in the cold room for the winter. Like these are all the traditional root crops, you know, potatoes, carrots, beets, cabbage, rutabaga. There's all these crops that grow very well in our climate that are harvested in the fall, stored for the whole winter. And this is what we should be eating. This is what makes ecological sense. This is what, you know, our body wants and needs because it's in tune with, with the weather outside. And this is what the supermarkets, this is what they should be, you know, serving us. You know, that's what we should be seeing on the shelves, not produce from all over the world. Like if it didn't, it didn't have an impact because it does. I also want to ask you whether you have some inspiring words for people who are looking at agriculture from the outside, because I, I meet a lot of people who are excited about agriculture and getting into agriculture in some way. And I know you meet a lot of people coming into agriculture. What would you say to people? Well, I think three times a day, you play a role in agriculture, you know, and I believe that. And I think that that connection needs to be just more, more present. We need to be all more conscious so that, you know, eating is an agricultural act. Hmm. So, you know, either you're a home gardener and, and you're growing your veggies or, you know, you're going to farmer's market or you have a CSA or, you know, you're asking your local grocer to, to carry local local produce. That's all part of the movement of, of what I call the good food revolution. And in, in, an, in a time of climate change, we see the consequences of the globalized economy. It's just like, it's, it's not that we want to go backward. It's not that at all. It's like the way forward and forward thinking on these, on food issues is to connect food with the territory where we are. And, and that, I, I, you know, it, however that translates in home gardens, commercial farms, local, the local food shed is also an, an act of resiliency in, in the face of climate change and, and everything that's going to happen in the next decade. Yeah. And, and winter growing and, and winter market gardening are such a, an ideal fit with that local food shed. And you've inspired me. Regular listeners know that my daughter Emma's always putting the pressure on to get a, a greenhouse. So now I am I was reading the book and, and thinking about in our yard how we can fit in a high tunnel and have within that some row covers or low tunnels. So thanks for the inspiration. Ah, I appreciate it. And thanks for having me on. It's always a pleasure to talk about this. Obviously, I'm very passionate about this and people want to know more. They can check out the website, uh, the Market Gardener Institute. We offer classes on winter farming. It's, uh, it's kind of like a new frontier. It's really exciting. It's exciting stuff. And we will have all of the contact information in the show notes. And thanks for hanging out with us today, Jean-Martin. Appreciate it. Have a good one, everyone. Bye now. Well, that was our chat with J.M. Forche, the co-author of The Winter Market Gardener, a successful grower's handbook for year-round harvests. And I mentioned in the beginning that J.M. has some other projects on the go too. So Growers & Co, Farm Equipment and & Clothing, and the website is growers.co. And the Market Gardener Institute, if anybody's interested in learning more about farming, themarketgardener.com is that website. And if this topic interests you, we have a couple past episodes that you should tune into. Season 5, Episode 11 with horticulturist and winter vegetable growing expert from Austria, Wolfgang Palma. And then Season 4, Episode 1 with Nikki Jabor from here in Canada talking all about growing crops under cover. Well, Donna, I think... One of the things that really struck me in that chat with JM was his distinction between winter growing and greenhouse growing in the winter. Did, mm -hmm. did that jump out at you too? Totally. And the way we eat, we are so accustomed to getting, and he was even talking about government subsidies for greenhouses that were growing 
hot crops. And he was saying, why don't we focus in cold climates on cold crops? This is not a new thing, he said. It's been done forever in France since, you know, 100 years or more. So I think he's really on to something. It's an old idea, but I'm so happy to hear him bring it back again. I think that's such a strong idea. Yeah, what's, what's old is new and this idea of high tech versus low tech. And, and as well as really liking the whole idea, just from a, an energy footprint standpoint, I think the high tech versus low tech really intrigues me because for home gardeners, as we talk about low tech, it means it's accessible to far more people. Yeah. And even the little, little trick he mentioned, which was to put the heat where the plants are. Most people think they have to heat the whole structure. Just put the heat, whether it's a poly tube or a little cable, right where the plants are growing. Because then with a little cover, like a Agrabon or whatever product you're using, you can keep that heat in. And I just love that. And I've used that a lot in my greenhouse, but I didn't have a name for it. So I'm happy now to hear that he is promoting that. He's doing that. That's the end of summer crops. No more peppers and tomatoes in the winter. Let's focus on growing spinach, growing arugula, kale. It's fine. Well, talking about those winter crops, I know sometimes people think of winter crops and they're thinking rutabagas, parsnips, and they're just not excited about that. But when he was describing the produce that they're growing, he used the terms world-class and epic. So I was glad to hear that. Yeah. And also he did separate out those storage crops. Yes, you can grow those, you can store them, but these are fresh foods. These are foods that chefs are excited about. These are foods we can all grow if we just tweak our setup a little bit. And I think that's the good news. That's really good news for gardeners. Yeah. Okay. Well, anything else that jumped out at you in, in this episode? Hmm. Well, first of all, he's in a very far northern climate. People think, oh, that Quebec, that's probably a warm place. It's not a warm place. It can get very cold. They have snow drifts that can cover half the greenhouse. So it's not about the temperature. It is about the light. And I've heard this said before by Elliot Coleman, and he's repeated it. If you don't have 10 hours at least per day, then you're not going to get that active growth. So he's got his crop started. In what I thought was really a fun idea, again, I do it, but I didn't have a name for it. He has a nursery and he moves them from the nursery because he waits till he takes his tomatoes out in the fall to put his spinach in. From in the nursery, the, the spinach grows and it has to be almost at mature size before fall hits. People don't sort of internalize this. They think, oh, maybe we need to add more lights. But in fact, when you're growing winter crops like JM is, I think his idea is, mature crops for going into winter, and then you're just holding them in your greenhouse. And that's an interesting twist for people who haven't done that before. That is, that is. Use the light while it's there. Mm -hmm. And don't be putting extra inputs like tons of heat. He puts very minimal heat, very minimal, just to stop the crops from freezing. He doesn't put extra light. He puts very minimal light. He sometimes uncovers his crops during the day when it warms up in the greenhouse, as it will even in the winter. And what he reminds me is that we're just a couple of weeks away in my latitude, and I think yours as well, from where we start to get longer days. So usually it's around Valentine's Day for me, and we'll get that 10 hours a day. I can uncover my spinach, and I'm excited about that. Well, you have a greenhouse, so you can start implementing some of these ideas, or it sounds like you already have. I don't have a greenhouse. I could use them in my cold frames, though. And certainly, as I said to JM at the end of the interview, Emma's been pressuring me to build that greenhouse. And I have plans actually on my desk in front of me <laughs> for a hoop house. So maybe I can report back in a few future episode about that. I think that would be fantastic, Steve. We're look really fun. Okay. Well, thanks, Donna. And we'll see you next week. And next week, I'm excited because we're talking tomatoes with Emma. All righty. We'd love it if you drop by to say hi online at foodgardenlife.com. We have articles about growing fruit, veg, using your homegrown produce, also about growing figs and lemons in cold climates. So say hi. Tell us the topics that would help you grow more of your own. And you'll also get to see the faces that go with these voices that you hear on the podcast. 
While you're at foodgardenlife.com, also grab our free newsletter. Subscribers get the subscriber-only cold climate fig guide and small space food gardening tip sheet. And you can head over to my website and grab my really cool printable PDF for a seed packet. You can personalize it for each type of seeds that you save. DonnaBalzer.com. Have a look. You're listening to the Food Garden Life Show. I'm Stephen Biggs. And I'm Donna Balzer, here to help you grow. 